morning. Peace to you. Really good to be with you. Please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. And once you're there, and again, I would encourage you to bring a, a Bible along with you. And by that, I mean like the codex, not the app. Nothing against that. If you are ever in the mood just to focus, we're embodied people, just to focus all that we are. But once you're there in Luke chapter 11, stand with me for the reading of Scripture. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, Yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Get out of my house. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Take a seat. My younger sister just gave birth to her firstborn child. And uh, he's the youngest cousin, baby Ellis. He's the youngest out of a whole tribe of cousins. My oldest is 17, which means he is the center of attention. And they live right downtown. We see them all the time. Our family's a bit obsessed with baby Ellis. This kid, I'm not, honestly, this is terrible. I'm not really a baby person. Everybody's like, they're so cute. I'm like, sorry, no. Um, but this one is. And yours too, mom, I promise, yours too. Kid, cute kid. And uh, right now, baby Ellis cannot say a word. But God willing, over the next few years of his life, we will get to watch him journey through this God-designed process of development, of learning to speak to his father and his mother and to his community. First, he will start to repeat words that his mom says or his dad says. If you ever watch a young parent, say mommy. No, say daddy. Say mother, back and forth. Say please. Say thank you. Say hello. Say goodbye. And then once he begins to kind of learn the ins and out of the English vocabulary and rudimentary grammar, he will begin to speak in full sentences and just say whatever is on his heart or mind, and then in theory, at one point, he will begin to ask questions and listen around the age of 37 or so. <laughs> in a similar way, we are working through four stages in the life of prayer, talking to God, talking with God, listening to God, and being with God. Of course, as I said last week when we kicked this off, stages is more than a little misleading because the spiritual journey is not linear. So you may find it more helpful to think of these four as kind of aspects or dimensions of your life of prayer. But if you're new to following Jesus, most of us learn to pray in a way not dissimilar from how we learn to speak. First, we learn the vocabulary and grammar of life with God. Uh, say mommy, say daddy, say our father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
But there comes a time, and most of you are likely well there by now, where we desire a far more personalized life of prayer. We want to pray our particular life to God, what's in our heart and our life, to talk with God. Meaning just to offer up to God whatever is stirring in our inner woman or man. We see this progression here in Luke chapter 11, from talking to God to talking with God. Again, Luke 11 is kind of ground zero for Jesus' theology of prayer. We left off last week in verse four. Let's just continue to work through the passage line by line. Verse five. Then Jesus said to them, so this is coming on the heels of the Lord's prayer. Suppose you have a friend. This is like a hypothetical scenario. And you go to him at midnight because you are a lousy friend, all right? And this is not a very great friend either, but let's just put this thing in context. You're at his door at midnight. Friend, you say, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. This is ancient Near Eastern culture. Hospitality is paramount, right? No food, it's a disaster, a real need. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children and I are in bed. I can't give up and give you anything. So, lousy friend. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your, and I love this translation, shameless audacity. Like, you get some chutzpah there to, like, knock on the door at midnight and not stop. He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Now, a little backstory. Jesus was a first century Jewish rabbi, and this was a common and kind of popular type of rabbinic teaching that New Testament scholars call how much more. It's a way of drawing your attention to a very fine point. Now, Jesus' point is not that God is a lousy friend or the grumpy neighbor next door, but if you, you know, knock and you don't give up and you bang on the door, he will eventually just relent and give you what you want. His point is, um, if the grumpy, cantankerous neighbor friend will give you what you ask for, how much more will your Father in heaven, for whom you are his daughter or his son, how much more will he give you what you ask for? So I say to you, verse 9, in light of that, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks the door will be opened. Three verbs in that paragraph, ask, seek, and knock. And in Greek, they're in a a tense that's a bit hard to render in English, the present progressive, which means it can be translated, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on banging on the door, because on the other side, again, is not a grumpy, begrudging neighbor, but is a loving father. Hence, Jesus' next line, verse 11. Which of you fathers, okay, unlike our culture, most men who were listening to Jesus would have been a father at this point. If your son asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake instead. Now, this is so lost in translation from Aramaic to Greek to English from the ancient era. This is actually a joke. It's quite funny. Just gonna tell you that. You don't need to laugh. You can laugh at the fact that this is a joke, but not at the joke. But this is actually quite hilarious. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then know you are evil, and that will bristle against you, in particular in a culture like LA, we hate this idea. But yet we have to admit, there's any father in the room, you know that your heart is at best a mixed bag. But even though there's this bent part of us, if we know how to give good gifts to your children, most of us would never imagine that, How much more, there it is, will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Do you see the progression? Jesus starts by teaching his disciples to talk to God, meaning to pray a pre-made prayer. We covered that last week. When you pray, say this, or that can be translated, when you pray, recite this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. But he just assumes that his followers will move on to talk with God, to come to the Father with all that they need and desire. Now, the second category of talking with God, underneath it, there are about three subcategories. They are, number one, gratitude, talking with God about what is good in your life and world. Lament, talking with God about what is evil in your life and world. And petition and intercession, asking God to fulfill his promises to overcome evil 
with good. A short word on each. First off, gratitude. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order, said the beginning point for this type of more interactive prayer and kind of dynamic relationship to God is to, quote, give thanks to God our Lord for the benefits received. He called ingratitude the failure to recognize the good things, the graces, and the gifts received. As such, ingratitude is the cause, beginning, and origin of all evil and sin. That is a fascinating claim. Whether you agree with that or not, just pause and think about that for a minute. He's saying that at the root of all evil and sin is a broken heart posture of ingratitude toward God. Think of Adam and Eve in the story of the Garden of Eden. Their sin was ultimately a failure to receive life as a gift, but rather to take it as a right. And while human rights are a thoroughly Christian concept, I mean, literally, if you were to sit down with a professor of philosophy, it comes from the Christian way. We must hold the idea of human rights with the conviction that ultimately all of life is a gift that the earth is the Lord's and all of its fullness, Psalm 24. We live in his place, we walk his land, we breathe his oxygen, we eat his food, everything is grace. Therefore, gratitude isn't just the beginning of prayer and it's certainly not just something you do before the meal or to start your day because it's good for your mental hygiene. It is the basis, the foundation, the posture of our entire relationship to God. At the center of the divine dance that we call the Trinity or the community of love in God is a generous, joyful, self-giving, others-focused, outward flow of love. It is written, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And of Jesus, he gave himself for our sins. In the gospel, the father gave the son and the son gave his life and the father and the son together gave the Holy Spirit and the Trinity all together forgave our sins and our shortcomings. To give and to forgive are two sides of the same character trait at the center of God. Generosity is at the center of the gospel and it is woven into the inner fabric of God's nature. Therefore, gratitude is the primary way that we relate to God. If you're new to prayer, new to God, new to the spiritual life, where do you start? Just start with two of the most beautiful words in the English language, thank you. The Jesuit priest, Timothy Gallagher, said this, recognizing God's loving gifts and recognizing God's loving presence through them, through a meal, through a paycheck, through a friendship, through a sunset, Summarized by the word gratitude lies at the very heart of our entire relationship to God. Paul writes that we are to be overflowing with thankfulness. What a beautiful word picture. Are you overflowing? I'm certainly not, but I can preach it, so let's do that. Are you overflowing? It turns out it's much easier to say things than to live them, by the way, but overflowing, just spilling over. There's so much gratitude in your heart. You ju you're gushing. You cannot stop. One way to measure your spiritual maturity, which is a goofy task. The only thing worse than trying to measure your spiritual maturity is not trying to measure your spiritual maturity. But one way to measure it is by your level of genuine, unforced thankfulness and joy. Ronald Rollheiser has this insight. To be properly grateful is the most primary of all religious attitudes. Proper gratitude is the ultimate virtue. It defines sanctity. Saints, holy persons, are people who are grateful, people who see and receive everything as a gift. Secondly, the next category is lament. Talking with God, not about what is good, but about what is evil in your life and in our world. The honest truth, our life and world are both full of things that are not good or beautiful, but are rather ugly and evil. What are we to do with all of the pain and the, 
and the grief and the anger and the rage and the confusion that all of us carry at some level in our body. What do you do with the Pepperdine students? What do you do with Israel and Gaza or the Ukraine or with racial injustice or political polarization? Or let's just talk about our own life, your own divorce, your own betrayal, your own failure, your own heartbreak. Pray it. Pete Gregg, the founder of 24-7, has this beautiful line, pray what you got. Meaning just how do you have a vibrant prayer life? Just pray what you got. You have anger, pray that. You have rage, pray that. You have doubt, pray that. You have confusion, pray that. You have gratitude, pray that. Pray what you got. It's an open secret that so many people find prayer boring. I know we're not like supposed to name that, but let's just be honest. So many people find it boring, and that is mostly because they're not actually praying. They're performing. We're so used to, and again, I'm the newcomer in LA, but holy cow, this is true everywhere and is certainly true here. We are so used to performing our life in front of other people. We edit our thoughts. Well, most of us do. Some of you don't. <laughs> but we edit our thoughts in order to present a more polished image. We don't want people to actually see who we are. I certainly don't want you to see who I am. I'm guessing that's mutual, mutual, to present a more polished image of ourselves to the world in order to be loved and not rejected and to succeed and not to fail. It's like, and what happens when you do that hour after hour, day after day, when some of your job is literal image management, like you are your brand, that will mess up your soul. When you do that, when we do this all day long, we can't help but then carry that performance management, that edit button over into our life with God. But prayer is not a place to be good. It is a place to be honest. C.S. Lewis used to say that in prayer, we lay before God what is in us, not what ought to be in us. Again, we come to prayer like it's, you can try to pray all the things that you wish were in you, or you can pray what's actually in you. Now this can be very hard, and let me just pause here for a moment. For some of us who struggle to get access to our more vulnerable emotions, due to the way our attachment system got wired up in our childhood, or our experience along the way, or betrayal, or hurt, or wounding, many of us have built a wall between ourselves and any feelings of weakness or pain and in doing so, we have unintentionally built a wall between ourselves and intimacy with God and with other people. Healing our ability to access those types of emotions that put us in touch with our vulnerability, our weakness, our, our, our contingent nature. It's not a simple, there's no simple three-step process. I can't give you a sermon with a little alliterating thing. But any effective treatment for that wounding of the soul will certainly put prayer front and center of the process. Because learning to pray is about learning to bring all that we are to God under the gaze of his loving eye. Because he already knows all that is inside of us. And this is, again, this is basic stuff, but it just is over a lot of our head, myself included. I have to have the reminder. I think of Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You perceive my thoughts from afar. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. I mean, there were stories where Jesus would just be sitting there or in the synagogue, and he would just name what somebody was thinking. That's terrifying yet with compassion and not with contempt. Now, talking honestly with God about our pain is a type of prayer that we call lament. It's very rare in modern worship, and I don't mean that as a, as a criticism. The worship culture in this community is beautiful, but it would be really weird to hear a modern worship song with lament in the lyrical component. But it's very common in the global historic church. And if you read the Psalms, which are the prayer book of the Bible, the worship songs of the Hebrew culture, scholars estimate that about two-thirds of the Psalms are lament. 
read them, pray them. They are full. I struggle to pray some of them. I pray the Psalms every morning. They are the center of my life with God. And I struggle to pray some of them because I feel guilty just for reading a few of them because they are full of the spectrum of human emotion, anger, rage, vengeance, jealousy, envy, revenge, bloodthirst, wounding, grief, doubt, hostility toward God, all of it is in there. Why would God like put that in the scripture? And not just put it in there like in a book that most of us don't read, but put it right in the, it's literally in the middle of your Bible, as a guidebook for your prayer. Because all of that stuff is in, in us already. All of us know what it is like to feel anger, to feel revenge, to want somebody to get what's coming to them, somebody who hurt us to get hurt even worse. We may suppress it, we may deny it, we may immediately pray it, but that stuff's in us. What are we to do with it? We are to pray it. One way of thinking about lament is as an emotionally healthy way of processing the pain of our life and our world with God. It's learning to complain to God because we all complain. <laughs> and if we don't complain to God, then we will likely end up complaining to our spouse or a roommate or our coworkers or our neighbors or our friends or even worse to the internet. We'll just vent and rage and criticize and scapegoat and yell into the digital ether and just leak emotional waste into the atmosphere. But notice, lament is not just complaining. It's complaining to God. There is a U-shape to lament that's not there into just the kind of gripey American way of life. We go down into our pain, but then we come back up in faith and in hope and in love. You see this U-shape all through the Psalms. Ann Voskamp said it this way, lament is a cry of belief in a good God, even when you're venting your doubt. A God who has his ear to our hearts, a God who transfigures the ugly into beauty. Uh, which is why another way of thinking about lament is as theological protest. Our generation, mine in particular, is all about protest and speaking truth to power, and we literally perfected the social media rant. And there's a time and a place for that. But what if we were to channel all of that pent-up anger into prayer? The social activist J.T. Thomas calls this not a protest, but a pray test, and argues this kind of praying against evil and injustice does something to us and through us. Now we're getting into this third category. Lament will naturally lead you to petition and intercession, which are two sides of the same coin. Petition is when we ask God to do something on our behalf. God, I need a job, I need to make rent, I need help, I need wisdom. Intercession is when we ask God to do something on someone else's behalf. Intercession is priestly work, where we stand before God on behalf of people and before people on behalf of God. And intercession at its best is a form of love. When you hear about a grief or a pain or a tragedy and you say to somebody, I will pray for you, which for half the time or more than half the time is no more than an empty platitude. But if you mean it and you follow through and you pray for another, that is a form of love. It's a way of holding another person's pain up before God's healing light. And both petition and intercession are summarized by Jesus' repeated command in the four gospels to ask. Paul Miller, who's written one of the best books on prayer, it's called The Praying Life, writes, all of Jesus' teachings on prayer in the gospels can be summarized with one word, ask. Over and over and over again, Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you. He regularly says to people, what do you want me to do for you? Can you imagine Jesus saying that to you? I certainly can. I have a list for when it happens. I'm ready. Many of us and the weird thing about asking, it's really weird. 
A lot of us don't like it. Again, it puts us in touch with our vulnerability. Uh, it puts us in touch. I mean, one of my favorite writers on prayer defines prayer as a search for help outside the self. Prayer brings us to the end of our power, our energy, our ability to shape the world the way we want or the way we need. It brings us to the end of ourself and the beginning of the infinite mystery that is God. But asking is, ah, it is hard for a lot of us. Many of us have thought about a problem in our life over and over and over again. Many of us struggle with negative rumination. Not me, but I hear other people really struggle <laughs> to have a healthy mind to live in. And we've just thought about this over and over. We've stayed up late at night. We've not been able to fall asleep, but we have yet to actually ask God about it. The 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon once said, whether we like it or not, asking is the rule of the kingdom. It's like a spiritual law of the universe, like gravity or the law of thermodynamics. It's just written into the fabric of way, the way God designed the spiritual life to be. And the single most important thing that Jesus teaches his disciples about asking is not just to ask, but to ask in his name. At one point, Jesus says this, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, there's a lot of confusion around this language of in Jesus' name. Most people put it as a tagline at the end of their prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. And that's okay, but you will not find a single example of that anywhere in the New Testament or the Old. If that phrase were to go anywhere in a prayer, at a logical level, it should go at the beginning, not the end. Because it is not a magic incantation that you kind of put at the end of your prayer to get what you want, like the alicadabra or the open sesame of the kingdom of God. In fact, in scripture, it's not a saying at all. It's a way of praying. There are at least two components to what it means to ask in Jesus' name. The first is to invoke our status as those who are, in the language of the New Testament, in Christ. So this is a deep theological concept in the New Testament, that when you are baptized, you are baptized into Christ. There's a beautiful line in Paul's writings, your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Over 70 times Paul writes in his letters that you and I, if you've been baptized, you are in Christ. The late Larry Hurtado, who's a brilliant New Testament scholar, put it this way, to pray in Jesus' name means that we enter into Jesus' status in God's favor and invoke Jesus' standing with God. Imagine the richest person you can possibly think of. Imagine in this hypothetical scenario, they're a good person and they have a great relationship with their son or their daughter. Imagine coming to them, the resources beyond what we can even fathom, and asking with that same, quote, shameless audacity that a child in a loving relationship with a person of ultimate means would ask. This means that we have the same, this theology of incorporation, that we're in Christ, that we have the same access to God that Jesus has. And when we come before God, the king of the universe, we come not as beggars off the street, but as royal sons and daughters. In the language of the New Testament, co-heirs with Christ who've been adopted, not just to any family, but into a royal family. So we come, again, in Jesus' language, with shameless audacity. The way we can imagine a prince or a princess or a king or a queen would ask. The second is to pray in alignment with Jesus' nature. So in the ancient world, a person's name, very different from ours today, a person's name was a synonym for their nature or their character, for who they were as a person. We ask in Jesus' name when we pray for God to do the kinds of things that he wants and desires to do that are in alignment with his nature. When we ask not against 
his nature, but in alignment. That's the sacred alignment through which the miraculous power of God flows, which is why if you pray for God to smite your enemies, the likelihood of that answered prayer is not great. If you pray for God to bless them, oh, it's frustrating how much he will just go around blessing all sorts of sundry characters. <laughs> it's so, not, I, don't, I certainly don't do that. I only bless the good people. Um, but God, unfortunately, has a whole different heart than mine, which is why we're all just living under the blessing of God day under day with all that is shadow within us. This is why if you pay close attention to the prayers of scripture all through, be it from Moses to the Psalms to Jesus to Paul in particular, they don't pray problems, they pray promises. Far less than saying, God, here's what I'm dealing with, help me out. It's God, you are this. God, you said this. God, you made this promise and I am calling on you to be and to do who you say you are and what you promise to do. But to pray this way, with this level of faith in the name of Jesus means that we have to believe our prayers actually make a difference in what does or does not happen. And most people don't believe that. The theologian Walter Wink said this so beautifully. This quote is a bit dense, but if you can just hang with me, it's worth it. Intercessory prayer, praying for other people, is spiritual defiance of what is in the way of what God has promised. Intercession visualizes an alternative future to the one apparently faded by the momentum of current forces. Prayer infuses the air of a time yet to be into the suffocating atmosphere of the present. History belongs to the intercessors who believe the future into being. Even a small number of people firmly committed to the new inevitability on which they have fixed their imaginations can decisively affect the shape the future takes. These shapers of the future are the intercessors. Tragically, few modern Christians actually believe this, that through prayer we can decisively affect the shape the future takes. Many of us are more likely to poke fun at all of our dear friends who are manifesting their new car and super awesome spouse or whatever than we are to actually consider that. What if manifesting is the parody of which true prayer is the reality? Then we are actually to pray. There is a deadly undercurrent of determinism in the modern church. Like the ancient Greeks, many believe that we are trapped by the fates. But again, the Lord's Prayer, we read this last week, just a minute ago. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus assumes two things in that prayer. One, that his will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven, at least not in full. In part, yes, but not in full. And two, that prayer does something to alter, to, to change and transform that reality. Dallas Willard, the late professor of USC, said it this way. God's response to our prayers is not a charade. He does not pretend that he is answering our prayer when he's only doing what he was going to do anyway. Our requests really do make a difference in what God does or does not do. The idea that everything would happen exactly as it does, regardless of whether we pray or not, is a specter that haunts the minds of many who sincerely profess belief in God. It makes prayer psychologically impossible, replacing it with dead ritual at best. Of course, this is not the biblical idea of prayer, nor is it the idea of people for whom prayer is a vital part of life. Prayer is more of a relational collaboration than anything else. I think of my, this is a weird analogy, but it's the one I was thinking about. We just bought this old house up in Topanga Canyon that we're in the process of fixing up and probably will be at for the next 10 years. And my oldest son is becoming a man and he loves design and architecture and that kind of stuff. And so we like to chat about what should we do here and what color should we paint this and should we blow this wall out or not? And there's just a lot of work to be done. And sometimes I just want my son to like shut up and do what I tell him to do. <laughs> I'm like, bro, carry these rocks down the hill because there's a lot of them. But I genuinely 
want to know his ideas. He has good sense, and I'm getting old, and I need a little design help from my son, you know? I, I want to know, what would you do here? You might inherit this home. You might live here longer than, I don't know, but how would you do this? What do you imagine here? What do you think would be a good creative solution to this problem? He doesn't have the resources I have. He, I went and looked in his, in his bank account yesterday. There's $54 there. <laughs> it's not going to fix up a house in L.A., right? <laughs> he does not have my resources. He does not have my wealth of, he does not have my power, but he has my heart. And I genuinely care and think that he has opinions and ideas and creative ideation that is important for the future of our family. Now, all analogies break down at some level, but there's a part of prayer that is less, go carry the rocks down the road, and more, what would you do with this room? What do you want to do? The French philosopher Blaise Pascal said, God has instituted prayer so as to confer upon his creatures the dignity of being causes. That's philosophical language, of being causes. The writer Sky Jitani interprets Pascal's line like this, we are not merely passive set pieces in a prearranged cosmic drama, but we are active participants with God in the writing, directing, design, and action that unfolds. Prayer, therefore, is much more than asking God for this or that outcome. It is drawing into communion with him and there taking up our privileged role as his people. In prayer, we are invited to join him in directing the course of his world. Now, before we wrap up, just a few words about this coming week's practice. It's all available for you in the guide. Again, there's a free version online if you want it. Or like Kara said, we can all ruin the world with Amazon and have it in 30 minutes. Um, but just to repeat from last week, the best way to learn how to pray is not by listening to me for four weeks talk at you. It's by praying. With all of Christian spirituality and prayer in particular, information alone is not enough. You have a bunch of new ideas now in your head, and those idea ideas have power and are very helpful, only to the extent at which those ideas get into the muscle memory of your neurobiology. It's got to get into you, because prayer, life with Jesus is, yes, it's not just an idea. It's not even just a habit or a way of life or a set of practices. It is ultimately a relational way of being. And so you can hear, you can read a book about marriage but in, or about conflict resolution, but until you actually go like have hard conversations with people, it's just theory. So that's what's before us now is let's, all right, take these ideas and let's put them into practice in a relational drawing into relationship with God. So just a few practices that we have. There's more details in your guide. The first is just to continue to fine tune your daily prayer rhythm. It can really, if you're new to prayer, if you're new to daily prayer, this can take a while to kind of figure it out and figure out what's best for you and your personality and your living situation, your apartment or attic or wherever you live in. Um, we have a few extra things that you may want to consider adding to what you started last week. First is to find an aid or a ritual or some kind of a habit cue in the language of neuroscience to help you transition in and out of prayer. Um, this is just incredibly helpful. I have a few quirky things I do every morning to kind of get me into the right frame of mind to make contact with God. Um, I pray to the east. It's a thing that ancient Christians used to do every single day where I will stand in my front porch and I will look east to the rising of the sun and I will let that with my body remember that Jesus in the prophetic tradition will return from the east. That my destiny is not what I read in the LA Times. It's not what I'm facing and thinking about right now. My destiny is the return of Jesus and that is where my life is going and what matters. And I frame that and I do a couple other quirky things that are just my things. You find your things. But what's a little aid or ritual to transition into prayer? Secondly, think about how you use your body in prayer. We have an embodied faith and a wandering mind. And so what you do with your body, and particularly your posture, matters a lot in prayer. Biblically, the most common way to pray is actually standing up with your eyes open, your hands in the air which is I know how all of you pray every single morning. 
And you can also pray kneeling or lying face down or walking or as Jesus did by mountain climbing or backpacking. Different postures are more conducive to different types of prayer. I find that with petition and intercession, I want to pray standing up, eyes open, out loud, ideally with other people. That is by far, the, or walking, the two most helpful ways that I kind of ask God. But for morning prayer, I find that actually sitting on the couch is really not helpful. Like a diaphragm is all, it's comfortable, it's lovely. But I mostly just end up drinking my coffee and worrying about the coming day, <laughs> not praying. So I find that for morning prayer, I sit on the floor. I sit cross-legged on the floor where I can just breathe deep and keep my chest back and put a little pain on my butt because I'm 43, I have about 30 minutes and that's like a good like contemplative prayer. I, at some point, I, my, it starts to hurt a lot and I have to get up. That's really helpful to keep my mind there sharp and attuned. Secondly, it's just to begin or end your day with gratitude, especially if you're new to prayer. Just start here. Start with gratitude. Get creative. You want to write something out. I, for years, I used to have a little piece of paper, and every morning I would write three gratitudes to begin my day or whatever you want. You want to paint. You want to post on Instagram. Whatever you, you do, you. But begin and end your day with a pause, with a moment of gratitude. And then finally, we have to spend some time this week asking to step into petition and intercession. We have two recommended exercises in the guide. The first is called prayer cards, where you just kind of write out and bullet point like some of the core needs of your life in this season, and you just kind of hover over that card. You can do it once a week, once a day, 10 times a day. It's up to you, and you just offer those prayers to God. The second is an exercise called praying the room, which I find really helpful. Again, if you can use your imagination and get it working for you, not against you in prayer, God built your brain to use imagination to access reality. That's how God built you. And so this, this very simple exercise where you just imagine yourself before Jesus or the Father in a room and you ask them to bring into the room anybody that they want you to intercede for. And you can just see, and you might have nothing. You might have crickets, or somebody might come into the room. You might want to even ask, okay, is there a specific thing that you want me to pray for? And again, it might feel crickets, or you might feel something in your heart. I need to pray this for that person. And again, what you're tapping into there, that's praying in Jesus' name. That's like you're trying to get in touch. What does God want to do in this person, in this situation? How do I add my yes to that? How do I pray in alignment with that and release the power of God? We also have reach exercises, recommended readings, stuff on unanswered prayer, all of that's in there. Again, everything is invitational. But as we pray, whether it is gratitude or lament or petition or intercession, as we now move into the coming week, please never forget that when we talk with God, God is forming us into the answer to our own prayers. This is one of the things that will sneak up on you. Often, the way your prayers will get answered is God will do something in you. Prayer is a way that we ask God to act and do things that only he can do in the world. And it is a way of giving God the time and the space to do what only he can do in us. And again, I think I said this last week, but this is the center. If there is a fulcrum lever in the spiritual life, it is how do I open up deeper and deeper layers of my inner woman or man and surrender them to God to make space for his grace to come in, heal, transform, liberate, and shape me to be more like Jesus. In a world, in a city, in a culture that is all about control, you will exit these doors and you will hear a thousand, not a thousand times, you'll hear six times this coming week. We preachers, we exaggerate. You'll hear a lot. Take control of your life. Oh, it's a great way to sell books. Take control of your life. I read the other day that the average American has 15% of the control over their life they think they do. <laughs> that 85% is why I hope you have a good therapist right there. So the cultural messaging is take control of your life. And the invitation, invitation of Jesus is surrender your life. And the world promises you peace, and instead that just gives you nothing but anxiety. 
and surrender sounds like slavery until you experience it and then you realize, oh, this is true freedom. So at some point in your prayer, today or this week, may you find yourself praying with Jesus. Here's my desires, here's what I want, here's what I think is best, but not my will, yours be done. Let's stand together and pray. Just want to give you a moment. I've said a lot. I just want to give you a moment to come to quiet before God. And as we begin to sing, to just offer up one gratitude to your Father. If you need prayer, if you're in a time of lament, if you're at the bottom of that U-shaped curve, we have a prayer team that would love to pray for you. All you need to do is kind of just lovingly elbow your way out of the aisle and make your way forward, and people up here will be waiting just to bless you, to bless what God is doing in you, to pray with you. Err on the side of coming, not not coming. But as we begin to sing, I just want to give you this moment to come to peace, to say the two most important words in all of the spiritual life.